thank you so much everyone too for joining the 2022 um, MeChap webinar series. Um, I'm Dr. Rachel Fisk. For those who of you who do not know me, I'm a Maine Assistant State Veterinarian. I am subbing in today for Dr. Michelle Walsh. Um, she is highly embroiled in Maine's highly pathogenic avian influenza response. And so um, I'm the lucky one who gets to spend two hours not focusing on poultry today. So um, I think that was a win-win, um, even if that means you guys have to suffer through, through me stumbling through teams. Um, I think we're all getting pretty good at this. Um, so I'm so glad that everyone could join us today. Um, a little bit of housekeeping details while I flash up are at my, um, you know, my, my PSAs and announcements. Um, if everyone, I think we have all of your videos turned off intentionally just to prevent distractions and um, make the bandwidth of our recording a little bit smoother. Um, we are going to record this presentation, so if for some reason you need to step away for a second, um, we, you can go back and watch the recording and, and fill in the gaps of what you've missed. Um, but if you would mute your phones, if you're calling in, and you can either push star six if you're on a landline, or I think on most cell phones, you can just hit the mute key. Um, and then certainly if you're on a computer um, or on the Teams app on a device, um, go ahead and make sure that you are muted. There will be um, opportunity to unmute and ask questions. You also, if you're on, the, on your computer or on the app, you can type questions into the chat. Um, Erica Coombs, who has been corresponding with you guys about the registration process, is going to monitor the chat for us today, um, and she can get any of your burning questions to our presenters. And then certainly if you are again on Teams in, on your desktop, if you click on the ellipses, the three dots, if you kind of jiggle your, your mouse or move your touchpad, you'll be able to see um, a focus on content. And so as I'm sharing the slides, um, you'll be able to, to see that is the largest and uh, rather than our so rather than our faces. Um, so I'm gonna get going with our first presentation. Carol, does that look okay? Yeah, I can see it great. Excellent. You guys, I'm I'm so 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 excited and privileged and thrilled to get to present Dr. Susan Moore. Um, Dr. Moore first spent her career in medical technology in human clinical laboratories in various places across the United States, as well as the American Red Cross Blood Services in Buffalo, New York. As the former Rabies Laboratory Director at Kansas State University, including 21 years spent in the field of rabies. She has experience in all aspects concerning rabies laboratory testing, including routine testing for rabies vaccine response, developing and modifying assays to suit the specific needs of researchers and pharmaceutical clients, and validation and quality assurance of assay performance. These eff efforts necessarily necessitate both technical knowledge and knowledge of regulatory requirements of rabies testing, which are her two main areas of focus. She consults with pharmaceutical companies on rabies vaccine trial, clinical trial and product results with researchers on ongoing and novel projects to improve current and future biologics for rabies prophylaxis and provides clinical consultation to patients and physicians regarding rabies pre and post exposure prophylaxis. In her new, very new and current position at the University of Missouri, Sorry, that's my New England, Missouri. She's mm -hmm. continuing with these activities. She's active in outreach activities on rabies serology, including with national and global agencies, including the World Health Organization, USDA, FDA, CDC, and the OIE. We are so excited. Dr. Moore, welcome, and thank you so much for presenting here in Maine. Well, thank you so much for the um, introduction. Um, and I think you covered it all. Uh, so you can understand from that that um, my interest in rabies is very keen. Um, I, I've very much enjoyed working in the rabies field. Um, so I, I want to cover primarily in this talk uh, the current risks and control measures. So I, I will cover later in the talk some basic things about rabies. I did want to cover the most current things first in case I run out of time. <laughs> um, because I do like to talk about rabies. So I'll get started here. Next slide. 
So awesome. just to get us started, um, I am going to cover um, some questions and myths just, just very quickly. Uh, so um, is rabies treatable? So I think we all know, and you can click it, no. Um, even though I think in these modern times, a lot of people think that any disease is treatable, rabies is still not treatable. So next click. Is rabies endemic in the United States? So I know with this audience, you're gonna know that's yes. Um, but again, this is some myths where a lot of uh, people, since we we do such a great job of controlling rabies uh, that a lot of people just don't think of it and kind of think that it's something in the past. So next click. Uh, what domestic animal is most often diagnosed with rabies? And click. Uh, it's cats. Um, and I think this surprises people as well because uh, dogs are well known worldwide and in, in, in history as being the, the animal that causes rabies, which is true worldwide. But in the United States, again, since we do such a good job of control and prevention, it's cats and cats are usually uh, not vaccinated as well as dogs. Uh, next click. In the United States, uh, what animal causes most human deaths? from rabies and um, it's bats. So uh, that should be not too surprising because uh, those of you who work in rabies know that most of the people who've died of uh, rabies in recent years have been from the bat variant. Next click. So we, we do control rabies so well in the United States uh, and it's one of the oldest infectious disease in the world, but it remains the most fatal. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and cover the answer to that question in this talk. So next slide, please. So just the very basics. Um, though mammals are susceptible, all mammals are susceptible, there are defined reservoirs uh, species by geography. Um, more is known today about rabies results uh, about how rabies results in death, but successful treatment is still uh, very elusive. Uh, prevention is still key through the control of vectors and immunizations on both veterinary and human health, human medical professionals are needed to be involved in rabies prevention and control. And this has uh, been demonstrated everywhere in the world. Um, so rabies, the disease is, is actually an acute progressive encephalomyelitis. Uh, it has the highest case fatality rate of any infectious disease. Um, it's among the oldest described diseases, and it's a leading uh, zoonosis as regards global public health. Um, and it's an, an excellent example of the One Health model. Next slide. So the two things I like to always mention is that it's very basic. Rabies is nearly 100% fatal. There's no effective treatment once symptoms appear. However, it's nearly 100% preventable. Um, and primarily that's through post and pre-exposure vaccination. And rabies vaccines are among the most safe and effective vaccines uh, that there are. Next slide. And as I touched on, we are actually, um, our success is kind of a, a downside as far as awareness. Um, the success story of rabies control and prevention in the US actually is a hindrance in that one has never heard of rabies or are known of rabies deaths in humans and pets. Uh, how important can it be? Um, is it still a thing? Uh, this is actually something that a colleague of mine heard when she was uh, on an airplane trip and chit-chatting with her, her seatmate, and they asked what she did, and she said she works in rabies. And the, the first question was, is that still a thing? So awareness is, is definitely something we have to struggle with. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, it may appear that the policies um, are, are not standardized from one local or state health department. Um, it's 
you know, if, if someone looks around, it seems like what's provided, it seems like different advice uh, wh wherever you are. But this is, as we all know, is largely driven by local rabies epidemiology. Each area knows best the rabies incidence uh, and involved species. So a bite from a wild or domestic animal can end up with different guidance for rabies post-exposure prophylaxis in, say, Florida um, compared to Nevada. In addition, the exposure characteristics as listed on the slide come into play. In some state local governments, uh, the primary, primary responsibility, in some states it's a local uh, group and then some it goes direct to the state. So that can vary as well. Um, and there are some states that don't have rabies vaccinations at all, um, Kansas being one. Um, and those may be at the local level, um, if at all. Uh, as well, there's some confusion um, that results from differing recommendations for vaccination between global and national uh, organizations such as the World Health Organization and in the United States, the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, the ACIP, and that's I will discuss that later as well. Um, so biogeography includes epidemiology, uh, availability to treatment, uh, extent of animal control measures and populations uh, in, in an area. So next slide, please. So I'd like to cover a little bit of history. One, I like history, but I also think it's very useful for those of us who work in uh, control and prevention and in public health, uh, what it was like uh, a long time ago. Um, and especially in the United States. So evidence indicates that rabies was not present in terrestrial animals before the Europeans settled in the New World. Uh, the earliest reports of rabies came from the areas of Mexico and Ecuador, in fact. Uh, the first documented documentation of rabies in North America was in Virginia uh, in 1753. Uh, could have obviously happened before, but this is the first documented cases. Uh, after that, numerous newspaper reports show rabies uh, was rampant in the major cities of like Boston, New York, Philadelphia. Um, and in, if you want to know anything about rabies during this period of time, you have to go back to the newspapers because that's where it was best uh, documented. So control measures that were put in place um, had been found, these were the ones that were found effective in England. Um, and this graph is a good illustration of the effectiveness and the difficulty uh, with sustaining the mus muzzling effort in Nevada. So in England, they were able in, I think in the early 1900s and then again in the 1920s um, to eliminate rabies. Uh, with muzzling. They had good um, adherence to the regulations, but this, this graph from Nevada shows um, in the solid bars, these were the years that the muzzling was, uh, muzzling of dogs was enforced, and the strike bars um, denote the opposition to muzzling that re resulted in relaxed laws. So it went up and down. So whenever it was enforced, muzzling dogs was enforced, the rabies cases went down. And then public opinion changed, the laws changed, and then the rabies cases went back up again. Um, and this is um, pretty interesting when you look through rabies history. So next slide. So prior to dog rabies uh, vaccine approvals and, and use of the vaccination and vaccination campaigns, uh, the majority of rabies cases in animals were dogs, uh, just like it is in developing countries today, and human cases were almost exclusively from dog bites. So when you look at these two maps of so the animal rabies cases uh, and then the human rabies cases, you can see uh, that correlation very, very much is where there's the most animal uh, cases, there are the most human cases. And it's kind of shocking to, um, to think, it's really not that long ago that people and pets in the United States were dying of rabies. So next slide. And also the awareness was kept up during this period of time uh, pre-vaccine uh, because it was in the news a lot, uh, and because children were were more likely to die of rabies uh, than adults, 
Um, there were a lot of stories like this. Uh, there, this was taken from uh, New York State Health News that was put out uh, every month, and then um, I was looking at them from the 1930s. And uh, it was interesting that there were uh, outcries to control uh, dogs and to somehow control rabies and dogs uh, because they knew that this was uh, over and over, you know, the reports of children dying of rabies because of dog bites. So next slide, please. As we know, this was the real turning point uh, when veterinary vaccines um, came into use and uh, is a tremendous success for the veterinary field um, to get these um, vaccine approvals and then to implement mass rabies vaccination campaigns. Uh, the preliminary step was getting data for a national picture. Uh, you always need surveillance uh, information before you can make any plans to do anything else. Uh, so this happened in 1938, uh, followed by consensus on a national plan, and which then came into being in 1946. And in a way, it seems strange that it took so long, uh, but the concept of Im immunizing animals actually uh, to protect humans was new and there were fears about the vaccine. Not surprising, people are afraid of vaccines. Um, and the timing coincided that with the end of World War II for these vaccination campaigns, when there was an explosion of stray dog uh, populations due to an increase in movement with the soldiers returning home um, and moving to new homes, often leaving pets behind. Uh, this contributed to uh, dog rabies epizootics in certain um, areas in certain cities uh, in the country. And it's important to note that this effort relied on public health education and news reporting to assure the public buy-in and awareness. So it was a very concerted, uh, controlled, uh, coordinated effort, um, including the actual planning for the vaccination campaigns and then awareness as well. And it was highly successful. Um, next slide, please. Um, Is this a good place for Dr. Honig to ask a question? Sure. Actually, I don't have a question. I was just inadvertently raised my hand. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I may have one later, but sorry about that. No, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> but, but please do uh, in the chat ask questions and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. But I, I really like this chart. You've probably seen this. Uh, it's on the CDC site. Uh, that really shows how the success of the vaccination campaigns resulted in such a drop of uh, dog rabies, uh, also in cats and cattle. Um, and in fact, in 2007, uh, the United States was declared a rabies uh, free of canine variant rabies. Uh, and that was uh, another huge achievement. Doesn't mean that dogs can't get rabies. It's just they're not spreading it around um, uh, be the, the variant. Uh, and so that's uh, something that I'm, I, will I will touch on uh, later. And this chart um, on the, the right shows how the, the cases in humans fell um, over this time period as well how uh, the, the source of rabies in human cases switched from um, dog cases, dog variant to wildlife. Uh, so it, the, it's really good to look at this data to see how the picture changed over time. Uh, next slide, please. So here uh, we are at the picture today. Um, though canine rabies is well controlled, exposure of rabies in domestic species while wildlife vectors continues to threaten both pets and humans. Um, so we have two uh, ecological cycles of the bat, which is all over the United States, itself, except for Hawaii, and the terrestrial uh, cycles, which are primarily raccoons, skunk, fox, and, and coyote. Uh, there are actually 24 rabies variants. Uh, so you have different variants within the species. Uh, that circulate in the United States, uh, with the raccoon strain being the highest reported, followed by South Central skunk. Uh, this map only shows the location of terrestrial strains, uh, but as I mentioned, bat variants occur um, all over the U.S. 
uh, except for Hawaii and Guam. Uh, majority of va the variants are in bats. Um, there's a lot of different species of bats that, that um, circulate rabies virus. So next slide, please. So this is just to show, um, again, reemphasize that the human rabies deaths in the United States uh, from native exposures, not imported, where they traveled somewhere else and came back, um, are primarily bad. Um, so this is what where we are today. And, and I think part of this uh, plays into the fact of awareness as well. There are so, so many times where um, the person who was exposed to a bat or bitten by a bat doesn't really even consider uh, rabies as a pos possible risk uh, from that bat bite. So next slide, please. So getting into what we are um, concerned about uh, in this day and age is, as far as control and prevention, is cross-species uh, transmission of uh, rabies between uh, the reservoirs. So the, the surveillance that we do in the United States includes tracking of this cross-species transmission. Uh, and these, this is transmission between species and they're called spillover cases. Uh, tracking this is important for the following reasons. Um, the spillover events increase the risk of human exposures, which we don't want. Um, it threatens current advances toward rabies control, especially in, in uh, the raccoon rabies areas where the spillover occurs into other species. And uh, also for raccoon strain, and it has increased in recent years, so we're concerned that this is occurring over and over. And cross-species transmission increases the risk of variant adaption uh, for sustained transmission in a new species. And so I, I give this example of, of what happened in Arizona in the early 2000s where um, the there were a number of skunks that were reported kind of unusually in the Flagstaff area. And um, prior to that, there was no terrestrial uh, uh, spread of rabies. And so when it uh, was investigated, it turns out that the skunks were actually transmitting a uh, big brown bat variant but it was being transmitted skunk to skunk. So these were no longer spillover cases. Uh, now there's terrestrial rabies um, in that area of Arizona. So this is a, uh, an example of the concern of cross-species transmission. Next slide, please. Um, and this figure just, uh, these are very nice figures that show how this cross-species transmission has increased and where it has increased here in the East Coast. Um, and the raccoon strain uh, cross-species transmission has been growing uh, since the early 1900s. So uh, USDA and CDC are, are, are keeping an eye on this, but it is a concern. Next slide, please. Uh, another concern is the rabies virus adaptions that can result in decreased vaccine uh, efficacy. Uh, this issue has been examined, and this group of research published this paper uh, quite recently in, in, in 2019. And what they found was that the adaptions in all the regions where rabies is present is occurring. Uh, specific changes in the rabies glycoprotein generate mutant strains that are more resistant to neutralizing antibodies that result from vaccination. Um, and this figure on the right shows the percent identity of these mutant strains against the vaccine strains that are used globally. Um, so it's usually the Pittman-Moore strain or the Flurry LEP strains that are, are, are used as the primary strains. And so that's what these mutants are being compared against. Um, it's important to note that the trend toward reduced identity is progressing and the number of these escape mutants detected is increasing. Um, as can be seen in the figure there. So the antigenic changes in the street, rabies street strains affects the degree of immunity conferred by the vaccine strains. Um, changes in antigenic three are the most significant. Um, and this, in this paper, the authors found that the street mutants uh, were resistant to neutralizing antibody um, 
in less than 10% of the strain. So it's not, you know, a, a terrible thing right now. However, there t tends to be a strain, a, a, a trend in this. And uh, it's definitely something we need to pay attention to and keep a, a watch on. Next slide, please. Another thing is, as I, I mentioned, we don't have canine strain anymore in the United States. So um, importing uh, rabbit dogs from areas that do have it is, is a risk. Um, and I, I wanted to mention this case in 2019 in particular, because it comes from my neck of the woods, um, Kansas City. Um, what happened was uh, 26 dogs were imported from Egypt. They actually flew from Egypt into Canada um, and they had rabies vaccination certificates and they actually also had rabies serology reports, which are not required. Um, and they were uh, brought to this pet rescue in Kansas City, uh, this pet rescue organization. Um, and all the dogs uh, were quite quickly adopted or fostered out. Um, but then about a month later, uh, one of them died of rabies and it was confirmed um, through sequencing that it was cosmopolitan dog strain uh, found in Egypt. Um, and we actually did a combination of um, Kansas Department of Health and, and uh, us at uh, the, Can the Key State Lab, of, we did serology testing on, on that rabbit dog and all the other dogs when they were brought back um, it indicated that only seven of those dogs showed evidence of a previous vaccination. We did the post serological monitoring procedure and only seven showed that they were previously vaccinated. Um, so it's all, another fun note was that all of them, though all of them were returned, uh, there was a search for a week of, for one of them that had gotten loose and was running around the KC metro area um, and it had on a purple sweater, so it's kind of unusual that no one can actually get their hands on it uh, in a week, but uh, they were all brought back. They all went through the, the quarantine um, procedure, and then they all were healthy at the end, and they were adopted out. Uh, but this, at the time, in 2019, was the third reported case of dogs uh, with rabies in the last four years, and then subsequent to this, there were more, and that brought about the, the changes that CDC uh, put in uh, last year of uh, banning uh, some of the um, countries from importing uh, dogs into the United States because of this, this forgery um, problem, with, with, uh, which is not uncommon. Um, at Kansas State, we knew that this was happening. Um, we, we gave some presentations on it. We haven't published it, but there we knew since 2008 there were a lot of forgeries. Uh, going on. So next slide. So nothing stays the same and improvements are always needed. Um, in rabies vaccine, the search is for more affordable and more accessible vaccines uh, because populations most in need are in developing countries. Uh, and we know that approximately 60,000 people mm -hmm die of rabies annually, uh, mostly in Asia wow. and Africa. Holy shit. Um, so the different mechanisms are being uh, pursued, such as using some adjuvants, um, uh, protein, uh, which has a, a excellent safety profile, um, but there's some difficulties with that. And then genetic vaccines, um, which are not ideal for, for post-exposure. Uh, prophylaxis uh, because th there's a de delay in the peak response, but for pre-exposure, it might be um, uh, a very good approach uh, because there's good memory formation. So next slide, please. So we do have some um, vaccines that are in um, clinical trial. And I think we all know about the uh, mRNA vaccines from COVID, uh, but actually they have been working on mRNA vaccines for rabies for a number of years. Um, and uh, they are, they're getting fairly close to doing clinical trials on that. Uh, inactivated uh, rabies virus uh, with an adjuvant 
uh, can accelerate the response with a re reduced dose. Um, so that what might be good for post exposure. Um, however, regulatory approval may be harder for genetic vaccines um, in rabies because it's fatal. Uh, because they produce one copy of the glycoprotein. So that reduces the breadth of the, the immune response uh, that, that can um, occur after uh, vaccination with, with this type of vaccine. And uh, regulatory people want to uh, look at proof of generation of an antibody response that will give broad specificity and, and looking at ways to prove that um, can can be difficult. I've I've served on an FDA committee looking at this type of approval, and it's um, it's a little bit difficult. So though I think it might take a while for some of these genetic um, genetic uh, vaccines uh, to gain approval in the United States for rabies. Um, and same same kind of problem occurs with monoclonals, which I'll touch on too. So next slide. So that now we're going into the um, development of immunoglobulins. So uh, the drive is to develop more cost-effective, accessible rabies immunoglobulin for that passive immunity that's used in post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, the requirement for passive immunity for optimal um, PEP was proven in a publication in 1955, uh, and it's a famous report of a rabid wolf attack in Iran, uh, this this rabid wolf attacked 29 people, and they uh, uh, medical uh, professionals and researchers took advantage of this situation in a way to uh, test this large group of people with anti-rabies serum, um, and they found out that the group that was treated with the anti-rabies serum and vaccine had a lower mortality rate at about 7% compared to 60% in the vaccine only group. Um, so these were bites to the head and neck. They were very vicious bites. So this was the worst case scenario for PEP. Um, and uh, luckily this, this, um, this publication uh, showed that uh, this process of giving pros uh, passive immunity was very, very effective and that the WHO responded right away by uh, recommending that as well. Um, the problems are with availability, uh, cost and safety. Um, and so the WHO started calling for development of monoclonal antibodies to replace ATRIG and uh, that has been um, pursued ever since, uh, since the early eight, uh, 2000s. So next slide, please. So again, uh, monoclonals kind of have the same uh, difficulty as uh, genetic vaccines, because uh, as opposed to polyclonal HREG, monoclonal antibody is directed to one of the rabies virus epitopes, uh, and that risks not being able to neutralize uh, a rabies strain with genetic or phenotypic changes in that epitope. Um, and this is especially important in areas where multiple vectors are the source of transmission of rabies, such as the United States. A um, uh, solution is to use a cocktail of monoclonals, usually two uh, monoclonals that have overlapping and complementary specificities. Um, and the only approved monoclonal, it just has one monoclonal in use today is in India. Um, but that is where the vast majority of cases are caused by dog bites. So basically one vector, one variant. Um, and the approved product has excellent specificity and neutralizing antibody. So this um, chart or this table I show here is the amount of, of work that has to be done to show um, adequate coverage of a monoclonal. Uh, is to test against all of these different strains and make sure that your your um, cocktail, your two monoclonals overlap enough um, that will, it will cover uh, most of the strains that we know of. So next slide, please. So I am actually on track pretty well. Um, I just want to review some things that, that the most important things that I, I think should be covered in a rabies review. So next slide. 
So as we know, um, we can click through these. The, the routes of exposure, the bite, um, by far is, is the most successful way to transmit it, followed by contamination of fresh, open, bleeding wounds and mucous membranes with infectious material. Um, and there's oral exposure, and this is kind of would be a, a more applied to animals that might may eat a rabbit, you know, a, a rabbit animal, and 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 can you know take in the virus. Uh, through eating it. Inhalation, uh, droplets are a risk, but this just does not naturally occur. And these are mo mainly accidental um, or intentional aerosol. Um, and it's a clear risk, but the, it's a very much lower risk. And ocular, this is only documented with corneal transplant, which has been reported. So next slide. So as talking about uh, saliva and rabies, uh, we know that secretion of the virus is intermittent and the amount secreted is generally variable and it can occur up to 10 days before signs and symptoms appear in dogs, cats, and ferrets. So it's not possible to diagnose basically uh, or solely on saliva. There are some uh, um, point of care or lateral flow devices that use saliva to detect the rabies virus. Uh, the problem with that is this intermittent uh, secretion and the amount of virus that's in saliva kind of uh, makes that, that type of uh, way of diagnosing uh, not very reliable. Um, it means that a negative result doesn't rule out the rabies. Uh, being present. The risk of getting rabies from exposure has been calculated, um, I, I named the, the publication here, um, at 5 to 80 uh, percent. And this is because of that intermittent um, uh, secretion and the, the variations that occur in an exposure. Uh, the risk from a scratch is about 50 times less. Um, and this uh, highly variable risk gave rise rise to dubious cures, which I'm going to mention later, uh, so have to remember that. Um, those um, and, and other places in the world where they may go to the witch doctor or the local wise person to get these dubious cures and they seem to be effective because, you know, it could be the case that somebody was exposed to a rabbit animal, but they didn't die of rabies, but they attribute uh, the cure to these mad stones or, or other other ways of um, uh, preventing rabies. So next slide. Um, I really like this figure because it shows um, the the way the virus moves through after an infection moves through the body and, and when signs and symptoms appear and when death happens. And one thing to remember is the incubation period can be short depending on where the bite is, the amount of virus um, in the bite um, from five days um, up to greater than two years. And I think seven years is the longest reported incubation period. However, in the United States, the, um, the mean is about 35 days. Uh, the general range is one to three months. Um, but what we know about the rabies virus is since it's neurotrophic, it doesn't replicate a lot at the site. So you have that really low replication at the virus site uh, because it's in uh, skin or muscle cells, um, and then it it has this incubation period, and not a lot is known about individual cases on on how that incubation period is long. Um, but what we know is during this time, it's it's trans it's working its way to the neuromuscular junction, and then it gets into the central nervous system, um, and then when we get to the prodrome uh, stage, which is about zero to 10 days, is then you get that rise in uh, the actual virus replication because it really replicates well once it gets to the brain. And then the acute phase uh, is two to seven days where you get the neurological signs and then coma uh, five to 14 days and then, then death. Um, so next slide, please. 
So what do we know now that we know um, these basic things about the virus? How does that help us with control and prevention? So next click. So it's neurotropic. It's an RNA virus. It's an envelope virus. So it's found neurotropic is going to be in the central nervous system and all innervated organs, uh, but primarily um, in the most amounts will be in the brain and the salivary glands. As we know, there's numerous strains that are adapted to other reservoirs, so we know how to um, prevent rabies because we know where we, we can find it. And because it's a, an RNA envelope virus, it's very fragile. Um, it's inactivated by temperature, drying and detergents, and it's not really easy to transmit it uh, just in the environment, right? It has to be a direct bite or a, a direct um, application to a mucous membrane. So next click. We know that it moves slowly after exposure, and so there's that, that uh, self-limiting -lim replication strategy of the virus to, to maintain uh, a low level of its proteins so the uh, peripheral immunity uh, doesn't detect it, so there's no immunity developed in the periphery. Uh, that's a really good evasion mechanism that the rabies virus has. And that slow movement along the nerves to the spinal column um, where in, until it gets to the brain where it, it replicates quite a bit. Next click. We know that the shedding in saliva is intermittent and the dose varies. Next click and that the virus is hidden from the peripheral immunity. And that's why most people who die of rabies do not develop antibodies or any kind of immunity until after um, signs and symptoms appear, when that, it's way too late by that time. It, uh, the virus has replicated quite a bit. So next slide, please. And uh, yeah, you can click on this, uh, that's fine. Uh, Studies have shown um, that's a glycoprotein uh, that is on the surface of the virus, and that's the target of the neutralizing antibodies. So we know that the vaccines, um, the vaccines have uh, lab-adapted strains, and they express the glycoprotein in abundance as opposed to wild-type virus. So they're going to be very effective. Uh, the nucleoprotein has been known to be an excellent activator of T cell activation. So next click. And so the most important role of rabies vaccination is this rapid um, induction of a sustained antibody response and the development of memory cells for, for pre-exposure vaccination. Um, and that help comes about with uh, the CD4 positive T cell. And next click. So this um, figure kind of shows the initial vaccination. So you have the rapid rise, so that's for post-exposure and we can take care of the, vac the virus there, but for pre-exposure, uh, what we want is a very rapid rise with your post-exposure um, to vaccination if you've previously been exposed to get that rapid rise. Again, every time someone is exposed or any time someone is exposed to rabies, the thing we want to, to achieve is a rapid rise in neutralizing antibody. So next slide. So for pre-exposure uh, vaccination, uh, Go ahead and click. Um, the current uh, pre-exposure series, as of today, is the three doses. Um, although you may or may not know that the ACIP has approved, um, it was back in February, a two-dose regimen. And, um, but the full recommendations haven't been published yet. They Pretty soon uh, they will be published. Uh, I served on the ACIP uh, rabies work group uh, for the last two and a half years. So uh, a lot of work went into these recommendations. Um, and so you'll be seeing some uh, publications coming out about that uh, very, very soon. Um, so the next click. So for pre-exposure vaccination is for specific groups that are at frequent or continuous exposure. And in the current ACIP, uh, we, we considered uh, primarily uh, or in addition recognized and unrecognized exposures as well as the frequency. So what we know about pre-exposure uh, vaccination, it may protect against unknown exposures. 
uh, depending on antibody level and the level of immunity at the time of exposure. Uh, we know that there's no need for that passive immunity, the rabies immune globulin in the case of re-exposure, and that we get a rapid um, anamnestic response upon those two uh, uh, PEP doses. So next click. And titer checks are used uh, to determine the presence of continued adequate immunity in the people who are at highest risk. So next slide. So post-exposure is a medical urgency, not an emergency, um, and it's complex. I'm sure everybody knows that uh, this is where the One Health comes in. Uh, you have to consider so many things um, involving a lot of professionals. So next slide. So post-exposure, and you can go ahead and click through all of this and I can talk through it, is one, wash the wound, um, please see a doctor, test the animal if it's available, and then undergo the post-exposure um, treatment or the post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, we use the Essen protocol uh, in the United States, and that's the uh, four vaccines uh, with the uh, RIG injection at day zero, uh, though there are other regimens in the United States. Remember, previously vaccinated individuals do not get the rig. Uh, next click. Uh, they get the two at day zero and day, day three. Next click. So their treatment looks like this instead of the whole thing. So you can imagine it's quite different as far as expense as well. So next slide. So this is the full story. So you have how, how the virus is moving through on, upon uh, transmission and infection. This shows uh, overlay of how PEP works. So in, in people who have not been vaccinated, they're going to get that passive immunity, that HRIG, so the blue dotted line. That zone of PEP mediated virus neutralization occurs right here. Um, and then once they've gotten to day seven, their, their vaccine induced uh, immunity uh, pumps in. And this takes care of the virus uh, before it can do anything uh, to move you to uh, the, the disease. And so for pre-exposure, when you get that day zero and day three, that red dotted line starts you know, within a day. Uh, so that would be the difference for pre-exposure immune response. So next slide. So just to quickly go through these, um, and you can go ahead and click through all of them. Uh, the, it's the presence of neutralizing antibody. Um, and so non-vaccinated people need that passive immunity. Previously vaccinated people need that boost. So we get that, that antibody up. Um, prophylaxis can be given and effective up until signs and symptoms appear. So it's never too late. Next slide. So um, go ahead and click through this. Uh, because it's 100% fatal uh, and we know it can be, pre be prevented with vaccines, we know we have to get that high level of uh, circulating uh, neutralizing antibody. Uh, we don't know, what we don't know is what is that effective level. Uh, next click, because there you can't do challenge um, in human, but we look at the animal uh, vaccine challenge studies so we can get some information there. And next slide, so there is no defined titer level. So in challenge studies, Obviously, they, they challenge, uh, they vaccinate some animals and they have control animals. They challenge them with a set dose, and then if they survive, um, that shows vaccine efficacy. Uh, the, the CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, only require 97 to 98% uh, of um, the vaccinated animals to survive. This is important to remember is, you know, the vaccine is not 100%, is not 100% effective in all situations. Um, so I think people assume it will be, and it, most of the time it's highly, highly effective, but there are vaccinated animals that have succumbed uh, to rabies. So next slide. So looking at the minimum, um, we do look at animal studies, and uh, the best one is this one by Bunn and Ridpath in 19, 
uh, 84 that showed that what the survival rate was in the these uh, the study the clinical study that they were doing, and what they showed at 0.2 was 95 percent, but when you got to 0.5 it was 99 percent, um, and so that gives us some information of what the minimum level should be. So next slide. So. I'm just going to touch on this briefly because this is a change. This will be in the ch a change in the ACIP. Previously, um, and go ahead and click on this one. Um, WHO has always said 0 0.5. Um, next click. But the ACIP has been confusing over the years. Um, and actually, if you want to click on the next slide, because I think I can talk about this a little bit better, because it displays how it's kind of changed what they thought was the low, lower limit. Um, it was very confusing. And I have to say, as uh, working in a rabies serology lab and telling people when to get a booster, uh, it, it was a little bit frustrating uh, because it was not, uh, it was not uh, reported at a level that we actually reported the results at when we report the results in international units and they're talking about complete neutralization at a one to five this is very very confusing so I am really happy to say a uh, next slide please that um, and also showing that the, the the ACIP level was a very low level that that increased the risk of false positives um, that the lower you you set that level, the the more the risk you're going to report out of false positives. So next slide. So we use a a, a test method that actually mimics the um, what's going to happen in the body. So you know mixing the virus with the the serum, um, seeing if there's antibody that neutralizes it, and then detects it, and we convert it to international units per mL. It is a, a bit of a variable test because you're using live virus uh, antibodies and cells, and so it's that variability that kind of bothered me as well as when you set that that level too low, and that's where you get that risk of false positives. Next slide, please. So, the ACIP will now fall in line with the WHO, and the lower limit is going to be 0 0.5. Uh, the concern was, are we going to have more people getting vaccinated uh, when they find out that they are below 0 0.5? So we did this analysis of looking at um, uh, rabies titer events from early 2000s to 2014. And on average, we found a 2.5 fold increase. Um, however, at the same time, the ACIP is going to change the recommendation of who has to have to have titer checks. And um, I'll get into that, that a little bit later, too. So next slide. So just to briefly touch on um, animal rabies prevention and control, because I, I think everybody knows that uh, in general, in the United States, we look to the compendium um, for animal rabies prevention and control. And the, it was last reviewed in 2016. And I'm just going to touch on some um, changes that happened. So next slide. First, I want to mention why, why are we concerned? Uh, so go ahead and click on this video because I, th I think it's really good. Uh, we have a um, horse out in a field and if somebody wasn't standing here with their video um, or their cell phone videotaping this, uh, th this may not be noticed. It was just the horse and the fox in the field. Um, the fox obviously notices the person <laughs> uh, taking the video. But the fox actually bites the horse, and you can imagine that that bite may not be noticed by the owners. Uh, the fox may not be t detected in the field. So, you know, why why worry? And go ahead and click. Uh, we know that indoor pets they escape outdoors, so things happen. Uh, wildlife enter homes, pens, barns, um, and so there are exposures we may not know about. So we, we should worry about our domestic animals. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the, a variety of signs are possible uh, for rabies. Um, and so there can be some differences in each case. Uh, aggressive behavior is common, uh, but they also may be uh, uncharacteristically affectionate. Uh, horses and livestock uh, may exhibit depression, self-mutilation, or sensitivity to light. Uh, and of course, rabid wildlife may lose their natural fear of humans and display unusual behavior. So next slide. So when I talk about animals and rabies control and prevention, uh, I, I break it down into animals that have bitten and animals that have bit. So for animals that have bitten, the main question is, is the biting dog, cat, or ferret infectious? That's what we want to know. Um, if there is a symptomatic animal, um, the advice is to euthanize and go ahead and test. Um, but if it's healthy or owned, it can go into that 10-day observation period because remember the pathogenesis, it can secrete uh, the virus a little bit before signs and symptoms appear in dogs, cats, and ferrets. Um, and that we know that vaccinated uh, pets can become rabid. Uh, if during that period signs and symptoms appear, then go ahead, euthanize and test. Uh, and vaccination is not recommended during this period to avoid confusion of ad adverse vaccine reactions with the actual symptoms of rabies. Of course, if it's a stray or unwanted animal, um, euthanize and test. So next slide. So for animals that have been bit um, by a confirmed or suspected ram and animal, the main question is, will the animal develop rabies? And in purple here, I've highlighted what changed in 2016, because obviously current, uh, they will get their booster um, and then go under owner's control for 45 days uh, because it's a low risk situation. Uh, we don't expect those animals to develop rabies. But if they're never vaccinated, the two jo choices are euthanize or go into uh, a four month strict quarantine for dogs and cats or six months for ferrets, uh, vaccinate in less than 68 hours. But uh, what was changed in 2016 is uh, a publication that showed that out of date animals respond to the uh, booster vaccination equally well as a currently vaccinated animal um, so that they have the same um, type of treatment, which is to get the booster and then go under owner's control for 45 days. If, and that is if the, the vaccination is documented. If it's undocumented, undocumented, then they have the option of going through this procedure called uh, post-serological monitoring, which provides serological proof of uh, prior vaccination. If that's obtained, then they can be considered currently vaccinated. So next slide. So I just wanted to briefly go over uh, working with the virus uh, that if you're working with infected animals, the highest viral concentrations are present in the central nervous system, salivary glands and saliva, but also can be found in uh, innervated tissues. So you have to remember where, you know, where the virus is and what's gonna be infectious. Uh, the most likely sources of exposure for animal care personnel are accidental uh, inoculation, cuts, and needle sticks with contaminated laboratory equipment or the actual bites from the animal, and exposure of the mucous membranes or broken skin um, to that infectious tissue or fluids. Uh, infectious aerosols have not been demonstrated to be a hazard to personnel working with routine clinical procedures or conducting uh, diagnostic examinations. The only cases of rabies from infectious aerosols were laboratory accidents with people working with very high, um, high titered uh, virus uh, material. So next slide. Got to the end. Um, I, if there are questions, um, I didn't see, uh, I can't see the chat. So please let me know what the questions are or please unmute um, and ask your questions. And thank you very much. Dr. Moore, one of the veterinarians participating today um, couldn't send her question to the chat, so I did it for her. Okay. 
um, and she said she was exposed to rabies, positive kitten that was hit by a car. She touched the gums and two staff members were scratched. She had a titer off the charts. Um, she mentioned she got duck embryo in vac school. Uh -huh. um, she was advised to get two boosters on day one and four, and she expected to only get one booster. Yes, so the uh, the current vac uh, the current advice, both from World Health Organization and the ACIP, is to get the two. Um, now, one I grant you this is one may be sufficient. Uh, you're going to get a very fast rise of uh, neutralizing antibody as well. Uh, you're going to activate your memory cells so your cellular immunity will will um, increase also. However, um, rabies is fatal and nobody um, in rabies control and prevention is willing <laughs> to say for sure that one shot is going to um, wake up the immune system uh, as much as will be needed. There's just too many variabilities of exposures, uh, individual health, et cetera, administration of the vaccine. There are so many things that people will worry about. Um, and so both the WHO SAGE committee, when they made their changes in 2018 and the ACIP committee, uh, we were just making the changes. Uh, we did consider this, uh, spoke on it and uh, did not uh, vote to to change this at all, and 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 that's why there's two. I hope that answered the question. And it, it doesn't matter what the level of antibody is, uh, because yes, you have a lot of circulating antibody, but you also want to stimulate uh, cellular immunity as well. You want everything firing on um, all cylinders, in other words. Any other questions? Um, there are two others. Um, do you predict that rabies serology will be useful in management of rabies in animals in the future? That's a very good question. I, I think uh, we've been moving in that direction in the years that I've worked in rabies. Uh, I've been doing rabies serology um for, for this purpose for so many years because in some localities um they certain little cities or whatever they they accept rabies serology um in lieu of uh vaccination uh and in the time i've worked in rabies the the efforts to move in that direction have grown and grown and grown um i think before that happens uh, the policymakers uh, have to come up with uh, certain certain regulations on how it's done and uh, who does the rabies serology and when it's done. Um, it has to be highly regulated and consider all all scenarios before it will actually, in in my opinion, before it becomes widely widely used. I, I think that the big, big, um, big opposition to moving in that direction is as humans, uh, we we usually know when we're exposed and can get that post exposure treatment, uh, like in the video with the horse. Uh, you may not know when your pet has been exposed to rabies, and you may not know to to take them and get their booster shot. And so I think there, that's probably the biggest. Uh, biggest thought in thought process in uh, not going in that direction. Okay, next question. Is the Milwaukee protocol currently used in humans? Uh, no, uh, it was quite uh, quite a tremendous event uh, when Gina Gisi survived and Dr. Willoughby treated her. Uh, the, the Milwaukee protocol has been used multiple, multiple times around the world. Uh, there have been some survivors in India. Uh, there's a really good publication on that. Uh, however, none have um, survived uh, as well as Gina did. 
And um, so it's, it's not been determined what exactly in the Mar Milwaukee protocol uh, that is the most effective. However, I will say that that uh, Milwaukee protocol has given rise to so much more interest in research in finding uh, a cure uh, and, and building on the Milwaukee protocol and investigating um, newer, newer techniques uh, like monoclonal antibodies, uh, biphasic antibodies, uh, different antivirals, how to, how to um, get those medications across the blood-brain barrier. Uh, in fact, um, today, uh, I, a group that I am on the advisory board, uh, we just published a paper um, moving in this direction. It's called the canine, um, canine rabies treatment initiative is actually trying to move the, this effort forward um, to get to the point where there is uh, some hope for people who who do develop rabies and uh, that we can get a better uh, prognosis uh, with, with this treatment. So thank you for that question. Great, and uh, the last question is, is there any data on recommendations for post-exposure vaccination of livestock? Yeah, I think that continues to be um, in, in most state regulations a case-by-case -case basis um, of, of post-exposure, but in theory, um, you know, it could follow uh, what we do for 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 dogs and, and cats, and I, there was a publication um, a number of years ago where CDC did a, a, a study in I think it was alpacas in Carolinas just to see if if post exposure uh, was effective, and I think it it showed that it was um, the and I. Honestly, can't remember the actual protocol that they used, but there was uh, a number of of animals in this herd. Um, I think there were two different uh, pens or, or uh, pastures, and so they had control animals, and they they uh, did post exposure on that. And um, if I could find it, I'll I'll send it to you. So in case anybody's interested in reading it. But yeah, I think if, if the more it is considered and there's more cases that it's used, um, you know, to provide guidance would be great. You guys, thank you so much, Dr. Moore. This is Rachel. I'm gonna um, keep moving things moving along just to give our mean CDC colleagues um, some time. Certainly, if you have more questions for Dr. Moore that sort of come up after the fact, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, we'll work to, to correspond with her and get you guys some answers. Um, so again, thank you so much. Um, I, I work with rabies quite a bit, not nearly to the degree that Dr. Moore does, but certainly I'm answering um, questions from a public health vet perspective about rabies on a daily and weekly basis, and I still learned quite a bit. So I'm so happy that, um, that you were able to present. Thank you. You guys, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip our break. Um, and so um, just remember that um, our, um, presentation is being recorded, so if you need a restroom break, please go right ahead and, and use it. You can, I'm sure we'll get you caught up. Um, and so in the interest of time, I'm going to move right along um, to our to our next presentation. Um, and this is by um, Dr. Megan Porter and Hara Sohail. They're our um, main CDC um, colleagues. Um, we have a great, we at the Department of Agriculture have a great working relationship with them. We work really, really well and really closely um, on a number of different One Health and public health initiatives. Um, so I'm just going to give some bios on both of them and then we can get them um, rolling with their presentations. So Megan, Megan Porter is a veterinarian and an infectious disease health educator at Maine CDC. She received her veterinary degree from Michigan State University in 2017. Prior to moving to Maine, she studied the biology and ecology of deer ticks in Michigan, working with veterinarians to collect ticks from companion dogs to map the invasion of deer ticks. 
Megan's current work as a health educator involves translating current science and public health recommendations for infectious diseases into messages that are relevant and easy to apply to Mainers' everyday lives. And Harris Sohail is the vector-borne and zoonotic epidemiologist at Maine CDC. He received his master's in public health in global, communica global communicable diseases from the University of South Florida in 2018, and more recently, an, a master's in spatial informatics from the University of Maine in 2021. While in Florida, Harris worked for a county mosquito control district con conducting mosquito surveillance and field research. Now at the health department, he spends most of his time on tick-borne disease and rabies surveillance, but is also involved with mosquito-borne diseases, brown tail moths, and other vectors or emerging diseases of concern. Megan and Harris, if you want to go ahead and unmute, and if you'd like to turn your videos on, you're more than welcome, but you certainly do not have to. Um, and I'll let you guys take it away. I'm all set to run your slides as you're ready. All right, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. All right, I've got several mute buttons on this headset, so I just wanted to make sure. All right, you can go to the next slide. We're, Horace and I are both happy to be here. We just wanna start off by saying we have no financial or commercial disclosures to share with you. Next slide. And so we're going to start with just a very broad review of rabies in Maine. Um, we want to talk just briefly about the role of Maine CDC and how we can help you as veterinarians when you run into rabies situations uh, in your everyday work lives. Um, we want to talk a little bit about some projects and programs and then really get into some of the, the data of rabies in Maine, which is really interesting. Then just do a quick review of management and control of rabies in Maine. Um, I know we may have some colleagues from New Hampshire here and other New England states. So just a, a quick message that these are specific to Maine, um, what we'll be presenting, and then hopefully we'll have some time to discuss some common questions that you guys have. Um, next slide. All right, so we're gonna dive right into rabies in Maine. Next slide, please. So let's step, set the stage with a brief history of the rabies virus here in Maine. Before the 1960s, dogs were the primary reservoir of rabies infections here in the United States, with thousands of rabid canines and dozens of human rabid cases reported each year. Following the canine vaccination campaigns that began in 1947, cases of canine rabies declined until canine rabies variant was eventually declared eradicated from the US in 2004. Of course, this decline in one variant gave rise to other variants, and Maine sees the introduction of the raccoon rabies variant in 1990. This introduction led to a large spike in rabid animal activity, but soon fell almost as sharply as it rose. From 2003 to the present, we see similar, albeit smaller, spikes occur almost every few years. Currently, cases are trending downward with the last spike seen in 2019. Hit next, please. And again. And one more time. And you might have to click one last time. While this is not a complete list, shows the major players involved in rabies management and control in the state of Maine. The main message here is that it takes a village to control and manage rabies. These include state and national government agencies, practitioners like yourselves, local towns, and some organizations, some of which you may be familiar with. Finally, most of these entities come together and are represented in the Maine Rabies Workgroup. Next slide, please. Next, we'll discuss the role of Maine CDC in rabies surveillance. Next slide, please. All right, so as we all know, rabies is a reportable condition in Maine that includes rabies in animals, sadly rabies in humans, and then also administration of post-exposure uh, prophylaxis or PEP. 
Um, so in the Infectious Disease Epidemiology Program, which is the program where both Horace and I uh, sit, we provide consultation to public audiences, to veterinarians, to really anyone who's working in the rabies response in Maine. Uh, this is available 24 seven um, through our consultation hotline. We do conduct investigations to follow up on any positive animal results and unsatisfactory results. Not that we're disappointed in the result, but that the animal uh, the, the animal was not in a, a satisfactory condition to be tested, um, just to clarify what that means. Uh, I myself, my role in Maine CDC is to provide education and outreach uh, on rabies, which includes press releases, releasing health alerts, social media, um, anything that involves media of any kind. Uh, we also do some state level analysis um, and we, we share that information in our annual surveillance report. And then we also do play a role in inter or cross agency projects, such as the, the cluster of fox rabies, um, of rabid foxes in the Bath Brunswick area, uh, dealing with wildlife rehabilitation volunteers who may be exposed to rabies, um, as well as when we may have uh, Healthcare professionals who are mistaken in their in their rabies protocol. Um, we also work closely with the Health and Environmental Testing Lab, or HEDL, uh, to do testing and to report out on data. This asterisk here next to HEDL's name is a very important asterisk because HEDL will soon be moving to a new building at some point, an undetermined time this year. So keep your eyes peeled because the address for dropping off rabies specimens for testing is going to change at some point in 2022 and we will be communicating that uh, when we we have more details um, next slide please all right so my favorite topic about rabies is the education and outreach so every year we try to put out at least one or two uh, press releases just to remind the public that they should leave wildlife alone um, and remind them about proper uh, bat exclusion uh, techniques that they can use on their house, et cetera, et cetera. We also put out health alerts to our healthcare partners, as well as our animal health partners, such as yourselves, um, anytime that we may have important health information regarding rabies in the state of Maine that we need to share. Um, I also put together social media campaigns and presentations such as this one, um, especially surrounding World Rabies Day, uh, which does take place in September. Uh, on September, uh, towards the end of September um, every year. So I would encourage any and all of you, if you have any extra bandwidth left after the last few years, to uh, celebrate World Rabies Day with us um, by putting together whatever type of event you may be able to. Next slide, please. All right. And one of my other jobs as a health educator is to produce and send out town letters that Maine CDC is made aware that an animal in Maine tested positive for rabies. We send a digital package of information to the town office of the town where that uh, that animal uh, was submitted from to inform them of this, this positive result. So each package contains an official letter to the town clerk or town manager, um, just informing them that an animal was uh, tested positive for rabies, that they should work with their animal control officer, and suggesting some language that they may want to use on social media to make their, their constituents aware of the situation. We also include some educational posters and brochures, um, as well as our rabies fact sheet. Next slide. So Dr. Moore already provided you with some updates regarding some ACIP updates to recommendations, but we also want to provide you with a quick update to some new rabies pre-exposure prophylaxis recommendations on the pipeline. And I apologize if this was already discussed uh, by Dr. Moore. So in February 2021, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP for short, put forward new recommendations for the rabies prep schedule for immunocompetent adults. First, ACIP recommended shortening the rabies prep schedule from three to two doses. This is followed by a recommendation for a booster dose for those who are at highest risk past three years. This change comes after findings from a non-inferiority study showed that the two-dose schedule is no worse than the three-dose schedule. However, I want to emphasize this next point, which is that federal CDC 
has not yet adopted these guidelines. These recommendations, once adopted, will provide benefits, we hope, like cost savings, and will align more closely with WHO recommendations. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and we also thought it was important to review the rabies exposures that resulted in death in 2021. In 2021, five humans died from the rabies virus in the US, the highest number reported in a decade. This number is particularly concerning considering that the US sees on average two to three human cases a year and saw no human cases in 2019 and 2020. For reference, the last human rabies death in Maine occurred in 1937, a fact that we are proud of. The table at the bottom shows, or rather describes, the five deaths that occurred in 2021. One individual died after exposure to a dog overseas, and not much is known about this investigation. The remaining four deaths were all associated with bats. While I won't describe each of these cases in detail, there are a few things worth noting. All four bats involved direct contact with a bat, but the bat was released in three of these situations and was therefore unavailable for testing. The Minnesota resident received treatment following exposure to a bat but still died. It was later discovered that this individual had an unrecognized immune disorder, which meant that the individual did not receive a fifth vaccine dose during treatment. The bat which exposed the Illinois resident tested positive for rabies, but the resident refused treatment due to longstanding fears of the vaccine. It marks the first time in recent memory that a patient refused rabies treatment following exposure to a known rabid animal. Finally, four of these cases were adults, but the resident from Texas was a child. These deaths highlight the increasing concerns surrounding bats, rabies, and human deaths. Next slide, please. Because of the pandemic, we've been quite limited in what we've been able to do over the last two years. However, there are a few unique projects and some ongoing programs that we've continued to maintain these past few years, and we thought we would share some of these with you. Next slide, please. I'll start with the mail a bat program. For those of you unfamiliar with this program, the mail a bat program is a service offered by the state in partnership with local veterinary clinics to expedite bat collection and shipping. The main purpose of this program was to reduce how often we were using game wardens and ACOs to transport bats to heddle. And this comes at a time when bats are being increasingly implicated in human cases. Maine Department of Ag supplies materials to veterinary clinics and these clinics serve as hubs where bats may be dropped off to be packaged and shipped to heddle for rabies testing. This began as a pilot program in 2018, and we have maintained partnerships with five local vet clinics and animal hospitals ever since. And just to put in a plug for this program, we are always looking for new partnerships to expand this program. If your facility has any interest or is even curious about joining, please reach out to either Rachel or myself. Next slide, please. And I don't think any presentation about rabies in Maine would be complete without mentioning something about the spike in rabid gray fox activity that we saw in the Bath and Brunswick area in the last few years. To summarize it briefly, an unusual cluster of rabies in gray foxes appeared between 2018 and 2020 in Sagadahawk County and the surrounding areas with the most activity seen from November 2019 to April 2020. While cases were largely observed in Bath and Brunswick, towns like Bodenham, Bowden, West Bath, and Harpswell also saw minor spikes in activity. Some of these stories even made national news, like the elderly gentleman from Bath who was attacked by a fox twice in four months. We, along with some of our partners, worked with affected communities to address this cluster in foxes. And we worked with some of our federal partners to investigate what was going on. In short, federal CDC sequenced 55 animals from Maine, including 34 gray foxes and 21 skunks and raccoons. What they discovered was three unique rabies clades in our state called Maine 1A, Maine 1B, and Maine 2. One clade in particular, Maine 1B, 
was found unique to only Fox samples. The concern here is that a new rabies subvariant could be emerging, and we don't want that. However, more data are needed to make final conclusions, and we hope to work with federal CDC and the USDA to conduct more enhanced rabies surveillance in the future. Next slide, please. One final program to know about is our oral rabies vaccine program. Wildlife Services is an agency within USDA APHIS or the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service, and they lead this initiative. Every year, USDA partakes in a wildlife rabies vaccination campaign to prevent the raccoon rabies variant from spreading northward and westward in the US and Canada. The baits, which are shown below, contain vaccines coated in fish meal or something similar. These baits are distributed by plane and car in targeted areas, which are shown in blue on the map. Next slide, please. And now we move on to one of my favorite topics, which is rabies data. Next slide, please. One of the questions that we are always asked is how does Maine compare to the rest of the United States? Well, on this slide, we begin to answer that question with rabid animal counts from other states that report relatively high numbers to federal CDC. Again, these are reported cases. Emphasis on the word reported. There are some states who, for different reasons, do not report their rabies counts to federal CDC, or they may be selective in which years they choose to report counts to federal CDC. So take these relationships with a grain of salt, or rather, I should say that this is not a complete data set. New York and Texas generally report the most rabid animals to federal CDC, and most states saw decreasing trends from 2019 to 2021, which mirrored rabies trends nationally. Next slide, please. Now let's take a closer look at how we compare with our neighbors. Of the states that report cases to the federal CDC, Maine reports the most rabies cases each year in New England. That said, you'll notice nothing above Massachusetts, and that's because they do not report their rabies cases to federal CDC in the same format as most other states. In a similar fashion, we see that rabies cases in New England are also currently trending downward. Next slide, please. This slide contains some stacked bar graphs showing the breakdown of rabies lab results at HEDL annually from 2017 to 2021. In blue are positive results, in orange negative results, and in gray, the top are those samples that were not tested. When you combine these three values, positive, negative, and not tested, you get the total numbers of animals submitted for testing each year, which is shown in the top right table. Now for the remaining data slides, metrics will either reflect total submissions or positive rabid animal activity. Next slide, please. Now shown here is a list of every animal species submitted to health for rabies testing in the last five years. And remember, not every animal that arrives at HEDL is tested for rabies. For example, the bird, which was submitted in 2017, was not tested for rabies. Unique to 2021 included a submission of a Canada lynx, the first in at least five years, which ultimately tested negative for rabies. Next slide, please. This slide shows a line graph of animal submissions to HEDL by month from 2017 to 2021. It's not a fantastic graph, but the point is to show that there is a clear spike or an increase in animal submissions between June and August, with submissions typically peaking in August. And this trend is consistent year after year. Now keep your eyes on this slide as we progress to the next one. Next slide, please. Can you spot the similarities? Like the previous slide, we're looking at submissions by month from 2017 to 2021, however, this time in only bats. What you probably noticed is that monthly trends in total animal submissions mirrors almost identically to the monthly trends of bat submissions. Next slide, please. 
We've already talked about which animal species show up at heddle for rabies testing. So this slide breaks down the frequency of those animal submissions to heddle, particularly in the year 2021, last year. Compared to other species, bats come out on top as the most submitted animal here in Maine. Specifically, it is big brown bats that are most frequently submitted. This is followed by cats and dogs, and then our common rabies vector species, like raccoons, skunks, foxes, and even woodchucks. These next few slides will now show strictly rabid animal data, or our positive results. Next slide, please. So when we look back five years, these are all of the submissions that tested positive for rabies. Between 2017 and 2021, 358 animals tested positive for rabies in Maine. Raccoons were the most frequently reported rabid animal, which is reflective of the known endemicity of the raccoon rabies variant here in Maine. While not included on this slide, so far in 2022, we've had five animals test positive for rabies, three raccoons, one bat, and one skunk. Next slide, please. This slide shows rabies trends from 2017 to 2021 in our four primary rabies vector species in Maine, bats, foxes, raccoons, and skunks. Starting with bats on the left, note that cases in bats in Maine are generally trending upward. This is slightly concerning and will be something that we continue to monitor for look, moving forward. Amongst foxes, we can see a clear spike in cases that occurred in 2019 and 2020. This can be attributed to the cluster of rabid foxes we saw at that time in the Bath and Brunswick area. And year-to-year -year trends among, among raccoons and skunks aren't as clear or as striking as recent trends in bats and foxes. As mentioned earlier, raccoons typically test positive more often than any other animal in Maine. However, if you compare the yellow bars showing 2020 data between foxes and raccoons, you'll notice that we reported more rabid foxes in 2020 than rabid raccoons. Next slide, please. And I know this is a messy plot, but what this slide tries to show is positive rabid animal activity by month from 2017 to 2021. The only message that I want you to take away from this slide is that although we typically experience a higher rabid animal burden in the second half of the year compared to the first half, there really isn't a strong temporal pattern amongst animal rabies cases as a whole here in Maine. Now, this might be a little different if we looked at this species by species. Next slide, please. Finally, this slide provides some geographic context to rabies in Maine. In light blue are 2021 counts, and dark blue is the five-year median. What probably pops out to you the most is Cumberland County, where we can see the 2021 count is well above the five-year median. Now, this is not surprising given the population density in the county and the higher rates of human-wildlife interactions that take place. Other counties with high five-year medians included Sagadahawk County, Kennebec County, and Androscoggin County. And with that, I will transfer it over back to Megan. Next slide, please. All right, thanks, Horace. Uh, Dr. Moore did touch on a lot of the aspects of management and control, um, but we're gonna go through these again uh, with a main specific context, just uh, for review's sake. So next slide, please. So there are some, there are certain important steps to take for every potential rabies exposure that you come across. Uh, the first step being to evaluate the exposure. If based on the exposure and availability of the animal and animal type um, and a number of other factors, we decide that we want to proceed with euthanizing and testing the specimen, it's really important uh, that we prepare the specimen correctly. Uh, that includes decapitating in a safe way um, by 
uh, a veterinarian or other trained personnel on your staff. Um, again, even though Dr. Moore did did mention that aerosol uh, transmission of rabies is rare, there are other dangers with decapitating uh, an animal that could expose you to rabies if the animal is rabid. So we just want to make sure that we're wearing appropriate PPE and being careful. We want to refrigerate that specimen if possible. Do not freeze it. Um, use refrigerant packs. Uh, in transport and make sure that you package it well. We're talking three layers with two leak proof bags inside of a cardboard cardboard or styrofoam box. When I was in vet school, I worked in the veterinary diagnostic lab and I heard horror stories of horse heads arriving in leaky cardboard boxes. So please be kind to your friendly neighborhood uh, diagnostic lab staff um, and make sure that we package those heads correctly. Um, and then once the specimen reaches Heddle, they will do the testing and report out the results. Uh, so we want to make sure that if there is no fee or if if there was no animal or human exposure, uh, a fee of $150 in the form of a check needs to accompany that specimen. We want to fill out the rabies submission form as completely as possible, including any exposures. Um, we here in the uh, at Maine CDC use that information um, if the animal ends up being positive. And then the <laughs> lab will uh, will report back to the submitter to to notify the pet owner or exposed person um, with those results. Next slide. So first step that we want to that we want to take is to determine if an exposure occurred. We want to rule out rabies in the attacking animal um, using testing, and then we want to implement control measures for the exposed domestic animal or person or the victim. Um, so when I talk about response measure over the next few slides, that's dealing with the attacking animal. And when I talk about control measures, that refers to caring for the victim animal or the person who was bitten to prevent rabies. Um, in most cases, uh, once we've completed our response measure and rolled in or rolled out rabies in the attacking animal, we can discontinue the control measure uh, if the animal was negative or uh, continue that control measure if the animal tests positive. Next slide, please. All right, so just to make sure that we're all starting on the same page, an exposure occurs when rabies virus is introduced into a bite wound or open cuts in the skin, especially on the hands, or onto mucous membranes, either from saliva or other potentially infectious material, such as neural tissue, as Dr. Moore mentioned in her talk. Um, what is not an exposure is a blood, a urine, a feces, or a skunk spray um, that do not get into an open wound or onto a mucous membrane. Um, these are not infectious uh, for rabies. Um, and just a reminder, you cannot get rabies by being near a rabid animal or touching its fur. So when we're uh, determining if an exposure occurred, there are multiple factors to consider. Uh, the first being the type of exposure. Is this a bite? Is this not a bite? Um, was this a bat exposure? Because as Dr. Moore mentioned, bats are very small. They have very small teeth, um, and it can be hard to determine. It can be hard for a person to determine if their animal or themselves uh, was actually bitten by a bat. We want to know the extent or severity of the exposure. Was this a head or neck bite, um, or was this uh, a bite or a scratch somewhere else on the body? We want to know what the type of animal was uh, that was involved, who is the attacker, um, since the risk of rabies transmission does vary depending on the type of animal species involved. We would like to know the vaccination status of the animal as well as the circumstance uh, leading to the bite or exposure, um, especially if this was a provoked versus an unprovoked bite. And then we we need to know to know how we're going to proceed next. What is the availability of the animal for confinement and observation or testing? Um, highlighted in red, we have epidemiology of rabies in the region. Um, in other parts of the country, this would likely pay, play a, a bigger role in determining if an exposure occurred. However, since we know that rabies is endemic in Maine, um, we assume that it is everywhere in Maine. Um, and so this will likely play less of a role in, uh, in our determining if an exposure occurred. Next slide, please. 
All right, so we're going to rule out rabies in the attacking animal, um, and this is regardless of the animal's vaccination status. So if the attacking animal is an owned domestic animal, our response measure is to confine and observe the animal for 10 days. If it's a stray domestic animal and uh, we have a hold of it, uh, and it's captured, then we're going to confine and observe it for 10 days if there is a location willing to do that or euthanize and submit that animal for testing. If the animal is not captured already, not available, we will attempt to locate that animal for 72 hours. Um, and if it can't be found, we will just recommend uh, going forward with control animal or control measures for the, the victim animal or human. For livestock, we're going to have you contact the the state vet at DACF uh, to determine how to proceed in that situation. And for wild animals, we're going to capture, uh, euthanize, and submit that animal for testing. Again, the same thing applies if we cannot locate that animal. We'll continue to attempt to locate it for 72 hours before uh, going ahead and just going forward with the control measures for the, the exposed animal or human. Next slide. All right, so once we are doing our response measure, whatever that is, we have to then go forward with recommendations based on what happened. So in situations where we've done a 10 day confinement and observation, if the animal survives, then there's no action that needs to, to, to follow after that. We're gonna report back to any person who was exposed or, or to any uh, client who has an owned animal um, that was exposed that uh, no action, it, no further action is needed and they can discontinue any control measures that were in place. If the animal becomes ill, we recommend that they are examined by a veterinarian. Um, if they have symptoms of rabies, we recommend euthanizing and testing. Uh, if those symptoms are not symptoms of rabies, we recommend treating that and then continuing the confinement. And then if the animal dies, of course, we are going to submit that animal for testing. With testing, if the animal comes back as positive or unsatisfactory, we're going to go forward and implement control measures for exposed domestic animals and recommend post-exposure prophylaxis for exposed people. Um, again, unsatisfactory means that the condition of the specimen did not allow for testing uh, when it arrived at the laboratory. If the animal is negative, no action is needed. We notify uh, the submitter um, and have them tell the client or the human who is exposed uh, that the animal was negative and they can discontrol, discontinue any control measures. Next slide. All right, so speaking of those control measures, again, control measure refers to caring for the victim animal or the person who was bitten um, and trying to prevent rabies in those situations. And this is dependent upon vaccination status, whereas the response measures were independent of vaccination status of the attacking animal. So if the victim is uh, specifically speaking of exposed dogs, cats, or ferrets in this situation, if the animal is up to date on vaccine or overdue, but has documentation of previous vaccine, we're going to boost that animal and then do a 45 day observation. If they are overdue for vaccine without documentation, we do have two options. You can either treat them as if they were never vaccinated or pursue serological monitoring. Uh, if they if they show an antibody response in that situation, then we will treat them as overdue with documentation above, boost them and do a 45 day observation. Um, if there is no response, we're gonna treat them as never vaccinated. So for those never vaccinated animals, we're going to either euthanize and test, or we will quarantine for four months for dogs and cats, or for six months for ferrets and vaccinate as soon as possible. Next slide, please. All right, just as a reminder for our control measures, we do have some different entities that have jurisdiction over enforcing those control measures for our animal species. So for domestic animals, the responsibility for enforcing those control measures lies within the municipality with the animal control officer. Uh, to figure out who your local animal control officer is, go ahead and call your local town office. For wild animals, uh, main uh, inland Fisheries and Wildlife, the game wardens there have jurisdiction. You can call the state police to figure out who your local game warden 
um, is. And then for livestock, we're going to have you call uh, the depart the main department of ag um, at the phone number listed. So call your state vet to figure out what the appropriate response is. Next slide, please. All right, in the interest of time, because we do want all of you to be able to ask uh, the questions that you have. I'm not going to go into detail on this slide. However, this chart, it's really adorable and I love the photos or the, the images of the animals. This chart is part of a handout that we are developing and hope to include uh, on our website within this year. Um, that does provide a very brief summary of all of our res rabies response and control measures. To read this chart, um, we want to follow the arrows. So in each situation, the arrow comes from the attacking animal and goes to the victim. So starting at the top with wild animals, moving to the left, we have a wild animal, animal attacking and biting a domestic owned pet. So you can follow you can follow the chart in that way. Um, in each situation, um, on the top of the arrow, highlighted by number one, is the response measure, uh, and that is what are what what are we going to do with the attacking animal? And then uh, number two, below each arrow, shows the control measure. What are we going to do with the victim, human or animal? Um, so I hope that we can make this available for all of you so that you have a very quick reference for all of these rabies response and control measures. Next slide. All right, so once we've made the decision that we are going to euthanize and test an animal, we want to again make sure to prepare the specimen appropriately. Heddle will not accept live animals except in uh, the case of bats. So please do not walk the, the potentially rabid horse down to the lab. They're not going to like that. Uh, we want to indicate on the submission form and on on the package if you are submitting a live bat. Nobody wants to open a container in the lab and have a live potentially rabid bat uh, escape into the lab. Again, we want to make sure that we are uh, performing decapitation um, only uh, by trained personnel. Um, so whether that's the veterinarian or other trained personnel in your clinic. Um, with the exception of bats, we only want to submit the animal's head. Uh, again, with bats, we can submit the entire bat since they are small and their their brain tissue is very delicate. So we want to make sure that that is submitted intact. Um, and remember to use proper PPE, your waterproof gloves, use waterproof bags so that we don't have a leakage happening uh, during shipment. We want to refrigerate this specimen prior to transport rather than freezing. Uh, Tests usually cannot be performed on decomposed animals. That's one of the reasons why we get those unsatisfactory results. So fresh is best. Um, we would do ask that you use refrigerant packs during transport. No ice or snow, please. Um, if the specimen is all is already frozen, we realize that you don't always have control of that. Please keep the specimen frozen so that the lab can do a slow controlled thaw. And then again, make sure that you're packaging using three layers of protection. Uh, so please do that according to the guidelines for submitting rabies specimens, which are included in our uh, main rabies guide management guidelines. So again, two leak proof plastic bags, then put those in a cardboard or styrofoam box. If there is the potential for puncture, say the animal has quills or shattered bones that could puncture one of those leak proof bags, please add newspaper um, just so that we, we can make sure that those leak proof bags remain intact. Next slide, please. All right, as I mentioned before, uh, for rabies testing, we submit specimens to our Health and Environmental Testing Laboratory, or HEDL. You can drop specimens off 24 hours a day. If you're dropping them off after hours, you'll need to call Capital Security, and they will let you in um, to, to submit that specimen. Again, HEDL is moving to a new building in 2022. We still don't have those details because it is a highly involved process. So look out for this change later in the year. We'll likely distribute a HAN with more relevant info. If you're submitting a specimen and you're not sure uh, if HEDL has moved yet, please just give us a call on our 24 hour consultation hotline um, and we can directly direct you to the right location. Next slide, please. All right, so once the, the testing, uh, for testing, you can submit animals Monday through Friday. Um, 
same you'll get the results on the same day if the specimen arrives before 9 a.m. Uh, if it arrives after that, uh, the results will be out the next day. Please fill out the rabies submission form, which is available for download on our website completely, including any information about exposures. That's vital for us if the animal does come back positive so that we can let uh, those people know um, and get them recommendations for what they need to do next. There is a $150 testing fee that is waived only if the exposure occurred to human or domestic animals. Um, so any other animals that are arriving for testing for other reasons must arrive with this testing fee. We only accept checks and they should be made out to the treasurer of the state of Maine. Uh, once we have those results, any positive or unsatisfactory results, um, Maine CDC will notify you as the submitter um, and we'll go ahead and investigate that case and provide recommendations to uh, and to the people who are exposed. Um, in that case, we're going to go ahead and continue all of our control measures for exposed animals and humans. Um, if the result is negative, the lab will notify you as the submitter directly um, and we'll have you go ahead and discontinue all of those control measures. Next slide, please. All right, that brings us to the end of our presentation, so we'll have plenty of time for questions. I do want to point out this top uh, reference here, the main rabies management guidelines. Um, those are available on our website, which I'll, I'll show on the next slide, uh, but these will be, we hope, updated this year, um, so also look for that communication when those are available. Next slide, please. All right. Uh, in the third section down on this slide, I do want to point out our main CDC rabies website um, where you can find all of this information, the digital format of the, the main rabies management guidelines, um, as well as a way that you can order paper copies um, if you would like that. And please feel free to contact Harris or myself with questions or call our 24 hour consultation line at 1-800-821-5821. And thank you. I think we can, we have plenty of time for questions. Megan and Harris, that was great. Thank you so much. I'm going to unshare my screen and we can kind of open it up. We can check the chat for questions. Go ahead and unmute if you have a question or you certainly can put something in the chat. You guys, this is your chance. All the questions that you call us with throughout the year, um, this is your chance to get to like live face to face. You got three of us. <laughs> and certainly if something comes up in, in daily practice, please feel free. Um, you have um, Megan and Harris's contact information. Of course, you have our contact information here in the Department of Agriculture. The three of us plus um, the um, other main CDC epidemiologists, the field epis, um, who are the ones responding to the um, 800 hotlines at main CDC. We all take questions about rabies from um, constituents, veterinarians, animal control officers um, every day. Um, before COVID, um, main CDC's metrics for their hotline, about a quarter of all of their questions were regarding rabies. So please know that we there are an abundance of resources out there for you guys um, to ask your questions. We're always, literally, always able to answer your questions. Someone's always available. I see a I see a hand from Dr. Honig. I'm thinking this is a new hand. <laughs> yes, it is a new hand. I raised it by mistake before. So as I think you know, and Michelle, you're Walsh know that, um, and you've said it already, that rabies, I was a state veterinarian uh, for a, a long time, and it was always one of the most common questions. And so I was almost obsessed with rabies um, history for a while, and and also, answer, you know, answering questions. But I, I was wondering if either one of you, um, either the three of you could clarify the um, situation with respect to livestock. So, um, a situation happens where a skunk gets into a dairy barn and uh, bites 
you know, several cows. And none of the none of the cows are vaccinated. And so th this actually happened uh, a number of years ago. But um, what are the recommend the current recommendations in the compendium on um, first of all, what do you tell a dairy farmer as far as their milk goes? And um, what do you what do you tell the farmer as far as um, um, you know, quarantining the animals, how long, um, boosting them right away. And I, I'm sure there are some farm animal veterinarians on who <laughs> may be interested in, in this and maybe the rest of the people are, but it was always something that was a little bit un, uh, not entirely clear because there didn't seem to be a lot of data. And um, so I was just wondering if you comment on that. Thanks. Want me to take this one because I think it's a yep. call. Call your main department of agriculture. So, um, so, so thanks, Don, for the question. Um, yes, we do still get cases like this that are reported occasionally where um, it's exposed to exposed to livestock. Um, we do recommend to the producer that the that they have a veterinarian out to boost the whole herd where potential exposure has occurred. We do typically place a quarantine um on on the herd it is typically a six month quarantine um but but consumption of milk is is still typically allowed so they those animals can still um go into the bulk tank um and in addition um some controlled um marketing of the animal so the animals can be sent to slaughter we dealt with a um, situation regarding that not all that long ago um where we'd had some exposed animals um, that had a slaughter date like within two weeks. Um, and so with some communication with the staff at the slaughter plant, um, the producer, the veterinarian, and Maine CDC, we did allow those animals to be moved to market under a controlled situation. The slaughter plant was actually really great and worked with us and um, their staff wore PPE. So again, that's based, just based on the rabies virus um, pathophysiology in the sense that um, there's there's pretty little risk to the the tissue um, or milk. Um, it's really a uh, um, you know CNS and and neural innervated tissue issue. As of now, Thank that's how we handle those things. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Rachel. Yep. Absolutely. Looks like there is a question in the chat. Um, any tips on how to decapitate easily? Do you want me to take that one too? <laughs> I think we're going to leave that one up to you as well. Okay. Um, so again, wearing wearing our PPE, um, I've I've heard and seen all sorts of of various um, um, methods, um, but but you know my my biggest tips are um, carefully. Um, usually right behind the skull, the, at that Atlanta occipital junction. Certainly, if you leave an extra vertebrae on there, the lab is not going to come after you. So if it is easier for you to get, um, you know, like C1, C2 or C2, C3, even if it's on a large livestock animal, no one's going to come and scold your, your poor anatomy skills. Um, you know, so certainly careful is better. Um, and um, but certainly even for the livestock, the lab is equipped to to take an, an entire horse head, um, an entire cow head. They're able to accommodate that in in their refrigerators, even if for a weekend after hours drop off. They've made sure that that has happened. Um, we have um, had a scenario where uh, a super intrepid veterinarian used a bone saw into the frontal sinus of an animal to remove the brain. Um, the big risk there, again, although Dr. Moore has, has reminded us that aerosolization is, is not a huge risk, um, certainly that would increase that risk many fold. Um, so let the, let the lab personnel that um, have a much more controlled um, lab situation and much more controlled vaccination status um, than even you as a veterinarian may have, and certainly way more than your clients have, um, let, let them do remove the brain from a skull. So that's kind of all I've got. Sorry if that's kind of a lame answer. So, and then Erica asks, <laughs> um, one of our veterinarians would like to know if a cat positive for rabies can pass along um, rabies to nursing kittens, and also suggestions for goat vaccines. Um, 
um, for ravens. So I'm, I'm thinking goat vaccines would be a thing, um, and that's something I can speak to um, as well. Um, most while while there isn't a rabies vaccine currently labeled for use in goats, um, just working with a large spectrum of Maine's large animal veterinarians, it's a pretty common practice. Um, and there's really, you know, very minimal side effects. So I know a lot of large animal veterinarians um, that administer rabies vaccinations to goats. Just remember all of your off label um, record keeping requirements. And then um, cat positive for rabies can pass along um, the virus to nursing kittens. That's a yes, possible, less likely, but but certainly possible. Rachel, you know, I think I see a question in the chat that came from uh, Charles from Rhode Island. Uh, his question was, I think it was addressed to us, what is your protocol for a domestic animal that bites a human and is euthanized within 10 days of the exposure? Do you require testing? Um, and, you know, I think that's a great question. Um, in general, we do recommend that to owners, uh, whether we're dealing with dogs, cats, and even livestock, that they do test their animals for rabies if the animal dies during that observation period, initial 10-day observation period. We do occasionally encounter owners who are a little less interested in pursuing testing for their deceased animals. Um, and we do have an avenue for owners to submit waivers for rabies testing, but it's not what I would call an established protocol. And it really occurs on a case by case basis in partnership with the local veterinarian um, for the animal. Uh, we definitely prefer to test the animal if it is available and was involved in, the ex in an exposure during that 10 day period. I hope that sort of answers that question. So again, it's not an established protocol, but there is an avenue for people to um, move over circumnavigate the testing, I guess you can say. We knew we were going to get that one. We were prepared. And, and that's probably one of our, our most frequently asked questions. So thank you for asking it. Um, I have one more in the chat and then Don, I'll get back to you. Um, how do you safely euthanize a bat? So um, so, so we do if so we we have a protocol that is available and certainly it's something that that we can send out. Um, we um, um, we include this in our um, packet um, when a clinic veterinary clinic signs up for the rabies mail a bat program. Um, typically, putting the bat um, into um, a, a box that can that can withstand some inhalant anesthesia. So most veterinary small animal veterinary clinics have the sort of naughty cat box. Um, so so we or so we, we we recommend using that. And then once the bat is um, visibly anesthetized, um, handle very safely. Ideally with um, both bike roll gloves as well as a uh, bite protective gloves. So again, those cat bite gloves come in handy for that. Um, and then and administering a uh, intraperitoneal um, dose of a uh, euthanasia solution. So fetal plus or euthanasia solution. Um, the dose is typically 0.1 cc, so you can do it with a insulin syringe. Um, so happy to provide that protocol. Um, you can either request that in the chat or you can contact me or anyone at the Department of Ag or Harris or Megan, I think they have access to those protocols as well. And Don, you have your hand up again. I don't know how I did that. I'm just legacy hand. I, okay, perfect. Sorry. <laughs> it's not me. It's ridiculous. Sorry about that. No, no worries. No worries. We're happy to take any other questions. But it does look like we're a couple minutes past the hour. You guys, thank you so much for for joining this webinar. I learned a lot. I had a lot of fun. Um, now you can kind of put faces to names. We are here for you guys. Please contact us and ask questions. Uh, when I say that if a week goes by that I don't receive a question about rabies from a veterinarian, I sort of get nervous and start checking my voicemail and email to make sure it's working. Um, so please reach out. We're always happy. We're always a, to, to speak with you or, when, or your staff. Um, and let us know how we can help and stay tuned for some lab moving and some um, updates to our main rabies management guidelines. Again, thank you so much to all of our speakers. This was really special. And um, as you can tell, rabies is near and dear to my heart. And um, I had a lot of fun this afternoon. Thank you, guys.